She's not royalty, but she is part of a dynasty. We'll sit down with Duck Commander's strong and kind, Corey Robertson. And then, diagnosed with cancer, with a baby in her body. I was six weeks pregnant, I was 38 years old, and I had stage three cancer. A mother risks her life to save another. I did the only thing I knew to do. I got on my knees and I prayed. On today's 700 Club, Welcome, folks, to this edition of the 700 Club. Ben Carson leading in the polls, amazing. And one can, just one can of soda a day can lead you toward a death of cancer. You've got some frightening things. Wow, that is that is frightening. We'll have it on the air. Yes, okay. exactly. Well, speaking of death, the deadly terrorists from Al-Qaeda and the brutal killers of ISIS, could they be joining forces? The leader of al-Qaeda is calling on Muslims to fight together against the United States and Russia, calling for a jihad. It's all happening while critics say President Obama isn't doing nearly enough to stop the bloody war in Syria. Republicans are blasting the president, saying that sending only 50 American special forces to Syria to fight ISIS is just a sign of weakness. Gary Lane has the story. The U.S. Deputy Secretary of State announced an expanded effort against ISIS in Syria. We are intensifying our efforts on all fronts. By supporting anti-Syrian rebels and pursuing diplomatic efforts to end the war. And now U.S. boots on the ground. American Special Forces, perhaps 50 or more, will be helping the Kurds in northern Syria. The Obama administration insists they're in Syria to act as advisors and trainers. As it relates to their mission, uh, this is an important thing for the American people to understand. These forces do not have a combat mission. Some U.S. politicians have criticized the move. On Fox News Sunday, Senator Lindsey Graham said, it shows Obama is not all in. It is a sign of weakness to ISIL. They've sized Obama up and they think he's weak. And to our allies, sending 50 troops means that we're not committed to destroying ISIL. And if we're not committed to destroying ISIL, they will attack us here. But the Russians do seem to be all in. So far, their bombing campaign has helped the Assad regime recapture about 5% of Syrian government territory. All of this has led to new comments from al-Qaeda's number one in command, Ayman al-Zawahiri. He's calling on Muslims to unify to drive the foreigners from Syria and the Middle East. In a new audio recording, Zawahiri said, quote, The Americans, Russians, Iranians, Alawites, and Hezbollah are coordinating their war against us. Are we not capable of stopping the fighting among ourselves so we can direct all our efforts against them? That means unifying with ISIS, a group al-Zawahiri has denounced, criticizing its self-proclaimed caliphate and caliph. There's an old saying in the Middle East, mm -hmm. me and my cousin against one another. We fight one another, but me and my cousin against all the others. So when there is a common enemy, mm -hmm. they will go after that common enemy. El Zawahiri also threatened another attack on America's heartland, and he praised the recent killing of Jews at Jerusalem's Temple Mount. And ISIS has apparently released a new anti-Semitic video in the Hebrew language threatening jihad against Israel. It refers to Jews as the grandchildren of monkeys and apes, and says the Islamic State will continue until it, quote, eradicates this disease from the world. Gary Lane, CBN News. Doesn't it break your heart, ladies and gentlemen? We have the power, we have a huge military. We could wipe out ISIS in a matter of a few weeks if we got serious about it. And uh, in terms of our Kurdish allies, the Peshmerga, we're not sending supplies to them. They're begging for heavy weapons, and we're not doing it. We send money to that uh, ineffective regime in Baghdad, and they, in turn, use the money for other things. We should be arming the Kurds directly. They would be a potent fighting force. We're not doing that. There's so many things we could do, and we're doing none of it. And this word game they're playing, semantics, well, it's not really combat. Oh, it's just a support mission. Baloney. Let's get with it. Our CBN News terrorism analyst, Eric Stackelbeck, is with us now. And Eric, what, what does it mean that al-Qaeda and ISIS, do you really think they're going to join up? 
Pat, tough to say this would be our worst nightmare, right? If Al Qaeda and ISIS, the two kingpins in this global jihadist movement, if they join forces. Now, they've been at each other's throats over the past two years or so since ISIS split from Al Qaeda. And Pat, clearly ISIS has become the big boy on the block. They control 36,000 square miles of territory in the heart of the Middle East. That's an area the size of Great Britain. Two things here with this audio release. Number one, maybe Al Qaeda, Ayman al Zawahri, maybe they kind of see the writing on the wall that ISIS has the momentum. They're drawing people from around the world to the cause. And number two, Pat, Al Qaeda wants to remain relevant. Look, since 9-11, they have carried out some smaller scale deadly attacks. They're still very dangerous, but nothing on the scale of what we see with ISIS right now. So Al Qaeda really, look, when it comes to street credibility, Pat, among these young jihadists around the world, Al Qaeda is desperately trying to keep pace with ISIS. And right now, ISIS is far ahead. Do we have any evidence of what ISIS thinks of President Obama? They don't like President Obama. They don't like any Western leader. They don't like any Christian or Jew. Basically, they have no respect for President Obama. And Pat, the more that we uh, hesitate in confronting ISIS in the Middle East, the more emboldened, empowered they become, and the less they respect President Obama and the United States. They see us as a paper tiger. We're putting in 50 special forces right now. Hey, our special forces, Pat, are the best in the world. We all know that. But 50 of them is not, even as great as they are, only 50 is not enough to get the job done. What we need to do to ISIS in the Middle East is what we did to the German war machine and the Japanese war machine during World War II. Crush them decisively. Pat, when hi history shows us when a great evil rises, it must be crushed immediately. Unfortunately, we are letting ISIS metastasize, spread its tentacles throughout the Middle East and North Africa. And by the way, we don't need a major U.S. ground presence to do this. Think of what we did in Afghanistan in 2001, Pat, where we backed the Northern Alliance. They routed the Taliban. We can do the same thing today in Iraq and Syria. Working with the Kurds, as you mentioned, Pat, would be a great start. What about North America? Do you think uh, Al Qaeda and ISIS are uh, planning some attack on the heartland of America? Absolutely, Pat. This is without a doubt. Number one, I'm glad you mentioned the heartland, Pat. In this audio tape we're talking about with Ayman al Zawahiri, he specifically mentioned striking the U.S. heartland. So that's number one. Not just New York City, Chicago, L.A., the big cities, but the heartland. Number two, Pat, very stunning statement recently by the FBI director, James Comey. Now, we've discussed here on the club how we have, according to the FBI director, we have investigations ongoing into ISIS activity in every state in the union, all 50 U.S. states. Well, Pat, a few weeks ago, he made an even more stunning statement, said that we have at least 900 investigations ongoing into ISIS-related activity here on U.S. soil. And he said, if this pace keeps up, the FBI may not be able to keep pace with all of these jihadi investigations that are going on in the United States right now. I, I argue, Pat, we've talked about this for years here on CBN News. We have a homegrown jihad epidemic. I do not say that word lightly. And if you think it's bad here, look at Europe, where at least 5,000 Europeans have left their comfortable homes, gone overseas, and joined ISIS. And Pat, one day, if they don't get killed over there, they will return here, U.S. citizens, European citizens, by the way, who can travel freely around the United States. Eric, I appreciate that very much. And ladies and gentlemen, this is real. We're not just uh, scaring just because we've just had Halloween. This is real. And uh, the threat to the United States, to Western Europe, to the democracies of the world, being challenged by this wicked, awful, brutal dictatorship uh, that uh, goes back to the seventh century or so in Saudi Arabia, and that's what they want to take us back to. They don't like modern civilization, they don't like Western civilization, and they certainly don't like democracy. Well, in other news, it looks like the Republicans have a new front runner in their presidential race because Donald Trump is no longer on top. Wendy Griffith has that story from the CBN newsroom. Here's Wendy. 
Pat, retired neurosurgeon and political outsider Ben Carson is now the leader among Republicans running for president. Carson has 29 percent in the new Wall Street Journal NBC News poll, followed by Donald Trump with 23 percent. Marco Rubio came in third with 11 percent, while Ted Cruz had 10 percent and Jeb Bush 8 percent. No other Republican was above 3 percent. This is the second poll in the last week showing Carson on top in the Republican race nationally. The U.S. Department of Education says that a school in suburban Chicago is violating the civil rights of a transgender student because it won't let her have the unrestricted use of the girls' locker room. The student and the American Civil Liberties Union filed a federal complaint against the Palatine Township School District 211. The Education Department said all students have a civil right to take part equally in school programs and activities, and the student says she's pleased by that decision. Pat? Wendy, I'm appalled. I mean, ladies and gentlemen, let's face it. You know, I, this transgender stuff, I mean, this was a boy. And this boy, we don't know what surgery was performed on him, if any. We don't know what his parts are. And yet he wants to go into the girls' locker room and see all the disrobed little girls running around. Unrestricted, right. And, and the, it's, it's like, what about the rights of the little girls who yeah. are in the locker well, I mean, room? They don't want some little boy in their locker room. And uh, he says, well, I'm not a little boy, I'm a little girl. Who ever heard of such a nonsense in a great nation like the United States of America? Why are we doing this? And the federal government is doing everything it can to push this agenda. Man, well, uh, there was an opportunity to give at least 20,000 jobs to steel workers, uh, stimulate the economy, and uh, have an incredible source of petroleum within the North American confines. Obama uh, vetoed, 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 killed it, killed it, killed it. And now there's news about the XL pipeline, Wendy. That's right, Pat. The company behind the Keystone XL oil pipeline from Canada to the Gulf of Mexico has asked the State Department to pause its review of the project. TransCanada says a suspension would be appropriate while it works with authorities in Nebraska on the route the pipeline would take through that state. The Obama administration is expected to reject the pipeline. The request for delay could mean that the next president, possibly a Republican, would have final say on the project. Well, just over a can of a soft drink a day could be enough to increase your risk of heart failure by 23 percent. Soft drinks have been linked to other diseases like obesity, diabetes and more. But researchers say it's the first time a connection has been found between these drinks and heart failure. But they add that the findings are not definite because of the nature of the study and an overall diet is the most important element for health for health but the study is enough for doctors to recommend that people cut back or cut out these drinks entirely pat uh i don't know if i can give up my coke when i go to the movie theater that's my treat you've got to give it up you're too important we can't have you dying and by the way it's heart attack not not cancer i, I misspoke at the beginning yeah. of the show well an, a number of things it sounds like yeah. that <laughs> this stuff is not good for you and coke is a very very big company and pepsi cola is a very very big company and it's going to be uh, a tough thing to get it fixed but in any event, we ingest so much garbage into our bodies, and that garbage is leading us to be terribly overweight. We've got uh, diabetes, we've got cancer, we've got heart conditions, we've got arteriosclerotic disease, and you go on and on and on, and uh, we're doing it through our mouths. And not just the bad stuff. We're just not putting in the good stuff. You know what I mean? I the, put yeah. in the good you stuff. You do put in the good yeah. stuff. You are impressive. Beans and nuts and berries and all that uh, paleo all stuff. All that bird food. Bird food, that's right. I'd be as healthy as a bird. All right, what's next? Well, still ahead, Corey Robertson serves up some redneck wisdom on raising children. Hear how this duck dynasty mother of five teaches her kids to be strong and kind. And up next, a third great awakening may be on the horizon. Hear how revival can begin with you after this. You know, I was reading the other day uh, Jesus' discussion 
And um, he says, uh, in terms of demon possession, he says, when a demon is cast out of a man, he goes through an arid desert seeking some place to rest, and he can't find anything. So he says, well, I had a much better deal back in the old house I was in, so I'm going to go back to where I was cast out of. And he says he comes back and he finds it swept and garnished. It's all clean and neat and empty and all ready. And he says he takes along with him about six or seven more that are more evil than he, and they enter the house. Uh, we talk about revival here in America, and we've had great religious revival. And then what happens is we go right back to what we were doing before. We cast out the demonic presence. And then a few years later, it comes in worse than ever. Keep that in mind when you watch this next story. And we ask you if you could do something right from your own home that would help turn this country around and get it back on the right path, you can. And many Americans are just doing just that. Paul Strand brings us the story from what could be the beginning of a third great awakening. Jesus. Christians from all over America are talking about and writing about God wanting to bring a third great awakening to the land. But many say it can't happen till serious Christians one by one get desperate, get praying, and get their own hearts revived first. Charisma senior editor Jennifer LeClaire. And will we use our faith Will we pray? What will we do? I believe God is watching, and I think the decisions that we are making in this period are just vital. This isn't something Jennifer LeClaire just writes about. You can find her in this building most days, in the prayer room, deep in prayer herself. We know that nothing is too hard for God. We know that He's waiting on His people who are called by His name to humble themselves and repent, turn from their wicked ways. Historian and pastor Eddie Hyatt. God's people in America needs to fall on their knees, fall on their face, and cry out to God. Popular preacher Dutch Sheets travels to all 50 states and finds these needed, desperate believers everywhere he goes. You have to be blind not to know that America's in real trouble, but they are, they are going after this thing in prayer. And that's where it always starts. And when you want to see a nation transformed, it does, it starts with us. So we ask the Lord, show us your glory, show us your power. We need an invasion from heaven where God comes down and heaven invades earth. I'm not asking based on our merits. I'm asking based on the fact that God loves to save. Hyatt quotes the famed colonial era preacher, Jonathan Edwards. When God purposes to do a thing in the earth, he first sets his people to praying for the very thing that he intends to do. But America before and during its birth was much more aware God is real and active. It went into the Revolutionary War flying a flag that said, appeal to heaven, a phrase popular political philosopher John Locke used. What Locke said was, when, all, when there is no other way, there's nothing you can do, humanly speaking, you still can appeal to heaven. And George Washington grabbed this, put it on a flag. It was a nation where even a doubter in organized religion like Ben Franklin stood up during the deadlock constitutional convention and declared the need to humbly ask God to move. Hyatt describes it in his latest book, The Faith and Vision of Benjamin Franklin. He stands up and exhorts them and calls them to prayer. And uh, he quotes from scripture. If one thing I learned, I've learned is that the, there's a God in heaven that rules over the affairs of men and nations. And if a sparrow can't fall to the ground without him knowing about it, how can a nation be born without God being a part of it? And I suggest we call upon him. According to those who were present, there was a spirit of reconciliation seemed to come upon the gathering. And they went back together and they hammered out the American Constitution. All three authors believe it's important for Christians to recall and retell such stories. So all realize the God who powerfully moved in earlier awakenings can do it again now. When we testify to what God has done in the past, it not only builds our faith, but I believe it causes him to move on that again. We're putting him in remembrance of what he did. At particular times in this nation's history, when it's faced great crises, God has preserved this nation by visiting us with great spiritual awakening. And you can be a catalyst to keep this great American story going. Begin by looking around and seeing where God would have you. He'll show you if you pray. Putting yourself, inserting yourself into the story gives you ownership of it. It causes you to, to grab hold and, and be determined to do your part to see this awakening come full bore. She read CBN News a prayer featured in her book, The Next Great Move of God. Holy Spirit, come. 
I want to experience your presence and power like never before. I don't want just a touch or a visitation or a season of revival. I want to live like Jesus said I could live. Open my eyes. So the question is, are you just sitting on the sidelines waiting and hoping God's going to bring about a third great awakening? Are you remembering the core point? Revival begins with you. Paul Strand, CBN News, reporting from Pompano Beach, Florida. Thanks, Paul. You know, as I studied some of the revivals, the truth is that uh, we had a revival, really major moves of God just prior to some cataclysm. Uh, just before the Civil War, was a great move, the Fulton Street prayer meeting in, in New York, then the bloodbath of the Civil War. Before World War I, there was a great move of God all over the world. So uh, if nothing else, it looks like disaster was coming, and when it comes, there will be a time people feel it in their hearts and they begin to pray. So we'll see what happens. But. Uh, how wonderful it would be for another great awakening to take our nation. Terry. Oh, that we would wake up without the disaster. Yes, sir. Mm. Well, coming up, a pregnant woman is diagnosed with stage three cancer. I had a 45% chance of survival if I had an abortion. Without an abortion, I had no chance. I was the mother that was told it's your life or your baby's life. Watch how this mom and her baby defy the doctor's prognosis. That's next. Hey, they tell me Regents got a uh, preview weekend coming up, uh, November the 14th, and this will be prospective masters, doctoral, and uh, uh, JD. Uh, that's Jewish mm -hmm. doctor for the law school. Uh, and uh, it's November the 14th, and it'll be a marvelous time. You'll have a good time, and you'll learn about the online opportunities and the wonderful educational opportunities that are here, financial aid and all the, all the rest of it. So you can call 1-757-352-4393. It's right there on your screen, or you can log in to uh, Region EDU. And uh, we Such be a delighted. beautiful campus. It'll it's be a great gorgeous. day. Crisp weather, the leaves are changing. It was voted one of the 30 prettiest campuses in the South. Mm -hmm. And that includes UVA, North Carolina, wow. Duke, and all those beautiful places. So it's a lovely, lovely place. Mm -hmm. And you'll enjoy it. We, the weather's great right now. I hope it stays that yeah, way. me too. <laughs> okay, what's next? <laughs> well, five years ago, Amy Hanley faced a terrifying medical dilemma. To save her own life, doctors told her that she would have to end the life of her unborn baby. I don't know that you can really put into words what that diagnosis feels like until you've been there. When Amy Henley heard she had cancer, she knew her life wasn't the only one at stake. I was six weeks pregnant, I was 38 years old, and I had stage three colorectal cancer. I did the only thing I knew to do. I got on my knees and I prayed. A week later, Amy went into surgery where doctors removed eight centimeters of her colon. Then a few days later, Amy's doctor came in with devastating news. The cancer had spread. They could treat it with chemo, but it would come at a cost. She told me that I had a 45% chance of survival if I had an abortion. Without an abortion, I had no chance. Other doctors agreed, but abortion was not an option for Amy and Bobby. What gives us the right to kill an un unborn baby? You know, a baby that has every potential of living and becoming, you know, an adult. It's like myself, who, who gives us the right to make that decision? And so many people will say to you, oh, I'm pro-life, except, well, I don't believe in that exception. I was that exception. I was the mother that was told it's your life or your baby's life. The couple sought out a second opinion. That's when they met Dr. Nikolanakis, an oncologist who prescribed a chemo regimen for Amy. I wasn't sure if it was going to be entirely safe or, you know, but I had confidence based on other examples with breast cancer and other types of cancer that I have treated, um, that I think she, with a specific drugs that she would do well. It's a different cancer than what some of the other studies he was looking at was different, but he said, I, I think it might work. And, um, I won't make you any promises, but I will treat you if that's what you want. Amy was 14 weeks pregnant when she started the treatments, but she and Bobby knew the outcome depended on God. 
We were constantly praying. Prayer was a part of every day. I had people come up to me that I'd even know on the street that had heard about our situation and say, hey man, can I pray with you? And so they'd, they'd, they'd come and pray with me. Maricia Parker, Amy's nurse during treatments at Athens Regional Medical Center, was touched by the couple's faith. And I can just remember her husband saying, we already love this baby. And that just hit me really hard that, you know, they already love this baby and they're gonna, you know, go through this really hard thing. What made it more difficult was there was no way to determine what effect the chemo might be having on the baby. There were no guarantees what could be happening to the baby, um, but we had a piece about it. Even Amy's OBGYN, Dr. Sepasi, knew the baby was in God's hands. You have to step back and say, I really wasn't doing anything. All I was doing was reassuring her that things look good, that I'm willing to be a part of this with you. I'm willing to do your C-section whenever it's time to do it. After Amy endured 11 rounds of chemo, it was time for her scheduled C-section. We had several pastor friends that were there, my husband, and they just made a circle around my bed and we just held hands and prayed over the baby, over the delivery. As much as I wish I would do that with all my patients, <laughs> um, it, it certainly was very profound that morning that that's something that we needed to do. And it made sense with everything that was leading up to that point that we needed to continue to remind ourselves to give God the glory and all of that. Joshua Hanley was born on August 28, 2010 in perfect health. I just cried, <laughs> overjoyed, thankful, so thankful. Not only was my little boy healthy, my wife was alive. You know, that, and that was 180 degrees from what we'd been told initially. I was, I was ecstatic. I mean, it was, it was wonderful. He was beautiful. She looked amazing, and she still had more treatments to go, but everything was just, it was just amazing. I just saw God's grace through that whole thing and how I don't always get to see that. Now five years old, Joshua is a typical active boy. So to me, the miraculous things are equally that you've got this cute little five-year-old who's running around seeming to act like everybody else. That child's gonna grow up to be a man one day and, um, and have a full life <clears throat> and a family that really loves him is to me extremely gratifying. I don't see that a lot. For me, that was extraordinary. As for Amy, the chemo was a success and there's been no sign of cancer since. We know that the Lord is bigger than any situation we could ever be in. And it doesn't matter. What's going on, if you're, in, if you're in the Lord's will, you're in the safest place you can be, regardless of the outcome of anything. If you're in God's will, that's where you want to be. And the Lord's in control of, of all that. We know that. God is always in control. And the thing I have learned is I don't have to understand what He's doing. He does not have to make sense to me. I just know God sees the beginning and He sees the end. He's got it all worked out, and I trust that His will is perfect, and there is a peace in that. And He can be trusted to take care of the circumstances, even when they don't make sense to us. Trust Him. I love their statement that God is bigger than anything yeah. you could face, and He well, is. What an amazing decision to make, though, here. They yes. Made, oh. They give the word to that woman and her husband, what are you going to do? And I mean, the easy answer would be, sure, take the kid, you know, and, and then get did my wife will. But no, she said, it's a precious life. I mean, it was, it was amazing. Hey, we've got a, a testimony. There's a lady named Samantha, lived in a place called Chandler, Texas. She was diagnosed with degenerative disc disease in 2012. On, in January, the next day she had surgery. The next year, the, the surgery failed, leaving her in excruciating pain. She couldn't walk and couldn't stand up straight. Then on September, Samantha was watching this program, and Terry, you were given by God a word of knowledge. Quote, there's somebody you've been having an issue with your back. It doesn't allow you to stand up straight. There's a lot of pain in your life. Just lift up, uh, look up now to God, and uh, God is healing you. And uh, guess what? She's healed. Samantha totally healed. She's doing fine. She doesn't have any problem walking with, with 
anymore. She's standing up straight. God is so big. You didn't know Samantha and Chandler. I still don't. You know, really, that's regenerative healing because she had surgery, which yeah, that's right. That's you know, right. didn't do the trick. So yeah. God did something Amen. creative did in that. Something else. Yeah, the, yes. in 2010, Ida, who lives in Randallstown, Maryland, suffered a stroke. She recovered from the immediate effects, but a shaking developed in her hands, and the problem persisted for the next five years. Last month, she was watching this program, and Pratt, you gave this word of knowledge. There is a shaking like a palsy in your hands. God is reaching deep into your brain and touching the centers that are causing that shaking. You are totally healed in Jesus' name. Ida raised her hands, claimed that word for herself. Immediately her hands stopped shaking and they haven't bothered her since. Well, folks, I want you to know something. God is almighty. God made you. He made the world. He's in charge of everything. And fixing up one of his creatures is no big deal for the Lord of the universe. Mm -hmm. It's no big deal. It isn't hard for God. With God, all things are possible. With him, nothing is impossible. Now, what do you have? You have leukemia. You have arthritis. You have diabetes. Uh, you have a progressive weakness. You have neurodegenerative disease. Whatever you've got, doesn't matter. God can heal it. And what we want to do is pray right now. We'll join hands. We're going to believe God for you. So please pray with us wherever you happen to be. Father, in Jesus' name, Terry and I are joining hands together. We believe in faith that the power of God will be here. Lord, reach out at this very moment and touch people in this audience, whoever they are. If somebody's got a terrible swelling in your throat, it's a type of infection. It may be a fungus of some kind. And right now, God has just healed you. You'll feel a burning in your throat, and you are healed in Jesus' name. Terry. Um, there's someone named Catherine. You'll know this is you because you're, you're just crying out to God, saying, do you, do you see me? Do you even know me? God sees your need, Catherine, and you are being touched and healed right at that point of need now. Just lift your hands up and receive it. Uh, you've had, I don't know if the name's Mike, but you, you've been having a degenerative nerve condition. And right now, God is reaching out and, and, and restoring that strength. You, the weakness is going. The nerve condition is, is being healed as we speak. And you will receive a strength and power back into your limbs, your arms, your hands, in Jesus' name. Terry, one more. And someone else, you have, um, it's not locked, locked jaw specifically, but your jaw is locked into place. I don't know what happened, if it was an accident or something, but God is releasing that for you now. Just move your jaw around freely. All of that stiffness and pain is gone. Throughout this audience, in the name of Jesus, let the power of God come into your life. May the anointing of the Lord be there. May you see a touch from Him in Jesus' name. Touch! Amen. Amen. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much. And if you need prayer, we're here. We've got folks on the phones, and they'd love to pray with you. They'd love to listen to your problems and laugh with you, cry with you, whatever. But it's a toll-free number. It's 1-800-759-0700. And if the lines for any reason are busy, be patient. Call back in, because they'll be here, even though this program isn't on the air at that time. They're still here to pray with you. Well, if you've ever watched Duck Dynasty, all those Cajuns from down there in Louisiana <laughs> with all the beards and all the funny stuff. Well, uh, it's quite a family. And Terry, you going to tell us about it. Well, it is quite a family. And coming up, Corey Robertson reveals the answer to the question that Duck Dynasty fans keep asking. How did you raise such good kids? Corey tells us her secret, and that's later on today's 700 Club. And welcome back to the 700 Club. An Arizona high school has appealed a referee's decision to eject a football player who gave thanks to God after scoring a touchdown. Dysart Demons running back Pedro Banda says he always grabs his face mask, points to the sky, and looks up after scoring. The referee called it excessive celebration and threw him out of the game. An ejection is an automatic one-game suspension, which means Banda could miss his team's first playoff appearance in 25 years. The school asked the Arizona Interscholastic Association to overturn that ruling. Well, while people in the U.S. marked Halloween, people in Haiti celebrated the country's voodoo festival of the dead by going to cemeteries. They took candles, food offerings, and bottles of dark rum. Priests and priestesses were dressed in white and evoked a spirit that is supposed to be the guardian of the dead. 
Other Haitians remembered dead relatives and asked spirits to grant favors and provide guidance. Well, you can always get the latest from CBN News by going to our website at CBNNews.com. Pat and Terry will be back with more of the 700 Club right after this. Last week, Corey Robertson was in our studio and she talked with Wendy Griffith about her new book on raising children called Strong and Kind. Here's Wendy. Willie and Corey Robertson's adventures on Duck Dynasty have made them and their children fan favorites. So what's the secret of their success as parents? Take a look. Many fans of the hit reality show Duck Dynasty wonder how Willie and Corey Robertson have managed to raise such good kids. In her book Strong and Kind, Corey shares her time-tested practices for parenting and talks about character traits kids need to lead successful lives. Please welcome back to the 700 Club, Corey Robertson. Corey, God bless you, good to see you. Thank you, thank you for having me. You guys have a blended family, of course, I mean biological and adopted kids. Tell us about the whole gang. We do. Well, our first child was John Luke. He um, is 20 years old and he got married this summer wow. to Mary Kate and she's just precious and the answer to prayers and they are studying at Liberty University now. So oh, okay. they're away at college. Our, and, um, it's just been fun. The, the wedding was beautiful and lots of fun. And then we have Sadie, who is 18, and um, people followed her and know her from yes, Dancing, with the, Dancing stars, with the Stars. And she made us so proud on that. And then um, Will. Will, it will be 14 next week. He would probably like for me to say he's 14. He's, <laughs> he's, he's almost there. He'll be 14 okay. next week. And um, he is, he, we adopted him when he was five weeks old. Aww. And then um, I have Bella, and they are 10 months apart. So Bella was a little mm. bit of a surprise, but a happy surprise. And um, and she is just precious. And she and Will are both playing basketball. The so basketball season just started. And then Rebecca. Oh, Rebecca. Rebecca came at, um, she came to live with us at 16. She's from Taiwan. Oh. And she came as an exchange student. And we just adopted her into our family. She's not officially adopted, but right. she's ours in our heart. Okay. And she is 27 years old. So she was the last one to come to us, but our oldest. Okay, mm -hmm. amazing. Well, how do you keep them grounded? How do you keep them from getting like these big heads? Because, you know, there's so much attention on your family. How do you keep them grounded? Well, I think, first of all, it's from the very beginning, we said and we prayed and we talked about that this is not about us. You know, whatever fame or success or money or whatever comes our way, it's not about us. It's about God and it's about giving Him the glory for it. It's about pointing people to Him. And so I think whenever you keep that on straight, then, you know, right. all the things that come your way don't matter because it, it's really still about pointing to Him. Absolutely. And you mentioned your daughter, Sadie, who's 18 and was on Dancing with the Stars. Um, did you think she was ready for that? How do you think she did? I, I think she did incredibly well. Yeah. She, like, rocked the dance floor. But beyond <laughs> that, she was um, just represented herself so beautifully and gracefully and, more importantly, represented God. She... Um, shined a light on him and pointed to him any chance she got. She really and did. It was, was very proud of her. I was amazing. nervous as a mom, you know, all of a sudden, sure. all those fears of like, oh, I'm sending my baby, you know, off to Hollywood. Like, yeah. You know, <laughs> how is she going to do? You know, all those fears. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, it came to this point where, and, you know, people spoke into me that, you know, we cannot be people of fear. We have to have faith and know that God mm -hmm. is with her. He is in her. He has gone before her. And, um, you know, he was with her the whole time. And that's right. I always great. say we need to be in the world, but not of the world, mm -hmm. because if how else are we going to change the world if we're not in the world? Right. So she not, was, how are we going to make an impact if we mm. kind of stick in to our little box and say to ourselves? Yeah. Well, your your family, your entire family is such a great example of that. And Sadie yeah. did an amazing job. Thank well, you. Why did you decide to write a book on parenting and did anyone help you? Yes, my mom wrote, my, wrote it with me, Chris. Okay. Yes, my mom's name is Chris Howard, and she um, taught me everything I know about parenting, <laughs> of course, and about being a woman, being strong and kind. And so mm -hmm. it was such an honor to write it with her. And then Willie contributes as well. So throughout the book, there's little parts, snippets where Willie kind of tells a story or gives some wisdom. And, um, you know, it was so much fun to do as a family. You know, yeah. Willie and I um, are a good team, I think, as parents. And, um, and my mom is just you know, of huge influence How long have you guys life. been married? 
24 years. Oh, wow. Praise yes. the Lord. Yes, thank Wonderful. you. We were 18 and 19. Yeah. We were just babies. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it's been a it's been a great ride. Still going strong. <laughs> well, you advise parents to choose two character traits to focus on uh, when you're developing your kids. Tell us what to you and Willie chose for your kids. Whenever our children were little, I actually had John Luke and Sadie, and I remember this moment. I was at a Bible study, women's Bible study group, and someone asked, you know, what values are you going to instill in your children? Yeah. And I went home that night and I wrote down strong and kind, and Willie and I talked about it and we prayed about it. And, you know, we chose strong because we wanted them to be able to withstand the difficult times in life, the hard times that would come, be strong in their faith, know that God is with right. them, and that, um, know that that um, they are his, they are his children. And even when tough times come and be, be strong with, with the peer pressure, the things that come their way. And then to be kind for others, to be yeah. generous and compassionate and all the things that go along with kindness. Absolutely. So those were the traits that we chose. And there's a ton of good ones. And that's the whole point of the book is not to tell you how to raise your children, but to say, think about it, you know, be intentional about mm -hmm. what values you want to instill in them and choose what, what, which ones you think are important. Well, in your book, you write when you're in love with your children instead of your spouse, everything gets mixed up and goes haywire. What do you mean by that? I think that is so true. I think that parents, you know, make that mistake a lot of time. They, they, they have this little bundle of joy and then they just all their attention goes directly to that baby and they, they lose the attention with their spouse and the absolutely best thing you can do for your children is to love your husband or for, as a husband to love your wife and to keep that marriage intact. And, um, you know, all the things that you teach your children about character can be thought, taught through marriage. Things like loyalty and humility and kindness and love and gentleness can be taught through a good marriage. So I think um, marriage is your number one priority. You got to be in love with your husband. You do. And you guys do a good example of that on, on the show. Well, are you still having fun um, doing the show and writing? And I guess you do a lot of speaking. I mean, what what do you enjoy doing the most? I am. I really am having a great time. You know, God has just blessed us with so many opportunities, and we're thankful for that. And, you know, we're going to use our time kind of, I guess, in the spotlight to um, proclaim His name and keep doing it. Well, Corey, you're doing a great job. We just appreciate you. And um, the book is called Strong and Kind and Other Important Character Traits Your Child Needs to Succeed. You're definitely going to want to get a hold of this. It's available wherever books are sold. God bless you. And thanks Thank for being so here. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Well, we'll be back with more of The 700 Club right after this. Coming up later, we'll bring it on with your email questions. So don't go away. To our top songs of the week, go to CBN Radio at CBN.com. Hey, you're watching the 700 Club. We've got some exciting questions for you. Some answers will come up. But first of all, a story about a lady named Martha. Her daughter was born with a cleft lip, and she promised her son that she would find help for his baby sister. So Martha visited 14 hospitals and clinics. Sometimes she had to walk all day to get there. Constantly being turned down, no, we can't help you. But her tenacity finally paid off when she met a man from Operation Blessing. Nine-year-old Mellon is very protective of his baby sister, Rixie. She was the first child ever to be born with a cleft lip in this small community in Honduras where everyone seems to know everyone else. Other kids used to say my sister was ugly because of the hole in her lip and asked them to stop saying those nicknames. The children's mother, Martha, told Mellon that an operation could fix Rixie's lip. She also promised to do everything she could to make that happen. Sometimes I had to walk a whole day just to try to find help. I didn't even have money for the bus fare. Martha took Rixie to 14 hospitals and clinics, trying to find someone who would do the surgery. The answer was always the same. No money, no surgery. Each time mom came back from the hospital, I got excited and ran to meet her and asked if Rixie was operated. But every time she said no, I got sad again to see her lips still open. As a single mom, Martha looked to her son for help with Rixie, 
and they often prayed together for a miracle. I asked God to give a surgery to my little sister and fix her lip. Then on her 15th visit to a city hospital, Martha met a man from Operation Blessing. He told her that we would help. After so many disappointments, someone finally said they would provide surgery for Ritzy. I was so excited. A few days later, a surgeon repaired Rixie's cleft lip. As soon as she was operated on, I felt so much joy. Now my little sister looks so pretty without that hole. Her face is cute. I want to say thank you to God first, and then thanks to Operation Blessing. They are a huge blessing. I hope they will keep on helping other kids like they did for my baby. Thanks, Operation Blessing, for helping my baby sister. Isn't it wonderful to be able to help somebody, give them a life? That little child had no, no life. I mean, imagine growing up uh, to adulthood with that hole in her face. She'd be shunned, laughed at, ostracized, couldn't find work. Now she's got a joyous hope and a future ahead of her, and it's so wonderful to see it. By the way, Operation Blessing, right now there's a terrible flooding that took place that, that uh, a hurricane came sweeping into uh, Mexico and that Patrice and and our team has been down there on the scene helping people building roofs, you know, setting up houses, giving them water and medicine and food and all the things they need. Wherever there's a disaster, it looks like we've got teams out there. I mean, they're right on the spot. We had a team in Mexico. We've got a team over there in the Himalayas. We've got a team in Pakistan. We've got a team hither and yon. I guess I say Pakistan, but in that area, we had a team coming in to help. And uh, if we haven't got them located, they're close away, we can fly them in. So we're there for them. And if you want to help those who are less fortunate, I've got something I want to give you. It's called the transforming word. It is uh, verses to overcome fear and experience peace. And you've got a testimony. I do. This is so wonderful. This is Regina, who lives in Thurman, North Carolina. She says, I had a spirit of fear so bad that it kept me inside my home for two years. I feared death and the death of loved ones. I started listening to the scriptures on the transforming word, verses to overcome fear, CD and the DVD, and reading God's word until that spirit had to leave. Praise God, I'm walking in his love. No medication helped, only his word. You know, That's was, unbelievable. Wouldn't leave her home. That fear is, is awful. It paralyzes. It grips you and literally enervates and pa yep. paralyzes you. So these are scriptures that help people overcome. All right, it's time for some questions. We've been running out of time on the show, but uh, what do well, you let's got? Let's bring it on with Peyton, oh, first of all, today. Pat, Peyton says, recently I was looking through my daughter's phone and I found many pictures of a cartoon skeleton with one glowing blue eye and wearing a hoodie. When I asked my daughter why she had such demonic images on her phone, she told me there was nothing wrong with it because it was from a video game. How do I help my daughter not be attracted to such demonic things? <laughs> well, give her something better. Uh, I think it's a fad. I, you know, the, these funny looking things, I, I, I think... I wouldn't make a big deal of it. I think if you do, you magnify the... You drive her to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you drive her to it. And uh, if you've got something more wholesome that she can enjoy, provide it for her. You must have something. There's got to be some video game that isn't so evil, but those, those things are filled with violence. I mean, you know, and, and brutality. It's unreal. And that's what the kids are playing. You say, oh, well, he's just playing a video game. Yeah, sure. Boom, boom, boom. Well, sometimes it's all about being cool with your friends because well, they exactly. all have it, I you know. know. <laughs> so, yeah, why not? Okay. okay. This is Don Pat, who says, I know we adults bring a lot of our own problems on ourselves, but why does God allow children to suffer pain, fear, and even death at the hands of pedophiles, abusive parents, murderers, etc.? Whenever I see or read these kinds of news stories, I'm left feeling so sad and wondering why. You know, Jesus said, Suffer the little children to come unto me and forbid them not, for of such is the kingdom of God, of heaven. And he says, These little children, their angels, always behold the face of my Father in heaven. Uh, God has a special place for little children. And the question is, how do, does it let it happen? God allows free will. And he allows free will to spread. Unfortunately, that's what happens when people who are evil are allowed to remain and then spread their evil. And then there's more of it. And then there's more and more and more. Listen, 
the time is going to come in America. First of all, the Supreme Court said homosexuality is a constitutional right. Now they've said homosexual marriage is a uh, right. Then they're going to say polygamy is a constitutional right. Then they're going to say polyamory is a constitutional right. Then they're going to say pedophile is a constitutional right. You mark my word. And they're talking about uh, transgender and sex change and all this stuff. I mean, we have lost our mind collectively, and it's going to get worse and worse and worse and worse. So trust me. And in the Quran, as far as the teaching of Islam, practiced by Ayatollah Khomeini in Iran, that it's appropriate and permissible to have sex with little babies, little babies, and certainly as young as five years old. So there's no such thing as pedophilia in that religion. Okay. Wow. All right. Wow. Max. Okay, this is Richard who says, the Bible says you should be a cheerful giver, but that's tough when I give part of my tithe automatically each month. I try to remember to be cheerful about this and be completely oblivious to it and not be completely oblivious to it, like it's just another automatic payment to the local cable TV company. Do you have any comments or suggestions on this matter? <laughs> well, stop making it automatic. I mean, you've set the, 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 the mechanism in play, do it so you write the check mm -hmm. and then you feel, but contemplate what's there and you are joyful at the fact that you're able to help uh, the work of the Lord. And, but that, that, you don't need me to tell you how to do that. It's, it's not that, that's not that hard. You can just direct your, uh, your bank to, to, not to do this anymore and you write the check yourself. Well, we leave you with today's Power Minute from Matthew 17, quote, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. Well, tomorrow we've got an exciting program. You don't want to miss it. And uh, for then, until then, for Terry and all of us, this is Pat Robertson. See you tomorrow.